Pentecost is one of my favorite times of the Christian year. Um, I love the story of the dry bones. I think part of that's because as growing up, I got to sing uh, the song about dry bones and bones and dry bones. Um, that was kind of always kind of fun, and it was, uh, I didn't understand what I was singing until a lot later, but hey, you know, at least we got started. I also then... Um, enjoy Pentecost because, well, it, it, it's a time of excitement if we let it be. And I will tell you that we really, really do need to become, um, become excited. Um, you know, I, I always say to folks, somebody trying to get in the front door and can't get in. Oh, there we go. All right. <laughs> um, we need to get excited about our service. How many of you um, would go to, I don't know, some place where there's a group of people and nothing was happening. Or, you'd, you know, I always say that if you don't believe in the resurrection of the dead, particularly when it comes to the church, just be around a church at uh, service time because you'll find the dead. And if you don't believe in the resurrection, just be around the church when church lets out because the dead come to life. It's amazing how people come to life when it's lunchtime or when they have reservations at a restaurant. See, I, I think we have got to begin to get excited about things. And by the way, it's not just the church that's lost its excitement about things. There are if you look at any of the organizations, or not any, but probably 90% of the organizations in um, our, certainly in our country, uh, that had anything to do with service or had anything to do with, with reaching out to other people or making connections or being nice to each other, most of them are dead. They really are. I mean, how many of you are members of a service club? Oh, all two of us. You see what I'm saying? And, and that has happened because we're no longer excited about anybody except us. And so we need to begin to get excited not only about us, but about God, about other people, about what we can do for each other. How many of you have ever either knowingly or willingly gotten involved in a service project of one sort or another? How many of you walked away from there going, yeah, that was fun? It's, it's not what happens. When we participate in something that makes a difference in people's lives, guess what happens? We come alive. And so I think we need to begin to look at Pentecost as a time to rekindle that flame. And, and I'll share with you my, my view of worship one of my big pieces of theology when it comes to worship is worship, one of the reasons we have worship is not, you know, God knows God's a good person. God's figured out God's good, you know. Um, we need to worship God, not to tell God God is good, but we need to tell God that we need to be fed that we need some, an influx of energy, that we need to, by being together and, and having music and scripture and all kinds of things, it, the idea is to get us up and excited because I'll tell you what, you go into the world, what do you find in the world? You find people that are really trying to get you all excited and, and, and energized, right? <laughs> Not where I live. You get in the world, you find people who are basically trying to tear you down, who are trying to take that energy away from you. And you spend a whole week doing that, and then you come in on Sunday morning, and if you're not careful, you fall asleep. <laughs> I try not to do that to you, but at any rate, you get the idea that, that worship is about getting excited, getting refilled with energy, okay? And, and that's why we do what we do. Now, I'm going to read the first of the, um, the Scripture today. I think I may pass on reading the second. You can do some of that your second, yourself. But Acts 2, verses 1 through 13. 
When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place, and suddenly from heaven there came a sound like a rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. It divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them the ability. Now, I don't know that you could hear what was going on when uh, the, the, the band was coming forward here, um, but they were all speaking a different language. They were all saying things like, Christ within me, Christ is risen. And it was all in a different language. By the way, thank you very much. It went away. Okay, <laughs> they, they, they got so much energy they had to go out, yeah. Um, but the reality of the situation was we had them do that to give us a sense of what might have happened. And, and the more we speak in tongues, when I, and I'm not talking about, you know, the traditional tongues. I'm talking about speaking the language of those around us. I don't know if you've noticed, but the poor don't speak the same language we do. Folks of different color don't speak the same language we do. Even if they're speaking, quote unquote, English, it's different. It means different things. Even if they're using the same words, because they've got a different set of experiences. When they hear a word, it's different. I'll tell you, I didn't understand that until I got down to, down to uh, Arkansas. And I, I, the church I served down there was just this big, beautiful church, as white as snow, painted and with the individuals. Now, they say, you ask them, you say, well, you know, we, we're, 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 we're not prejudiced. Really? They had five or six African-American people. They all sat right there, about three rows behind you right behind them, and they sat together. And what was really interesting was people would escort them in. They'd come in with them. they say, hi, how are you? Put them in that pew and go sit somewhere else. And, and, and we'd talk. You know, we'd have conversation. And there was obvious that the folks of that congregation had no clue what it was like to be poor, what it was like to not be able to feed their families, had no idea what it was like not to be able to pay the rent, not because they weren't working, but because they weren't making enough money to be able to pay the rent. See, it's a different language, and we need to be able to speak different languages, or maybe rather than speak different languages, maybe we need to be able to hear different languages. That's hard. <laughs> it really is. But maybe you just kind of need to say, talk to me, and then, and then be open to the experience. Now, it's not going to happen for you the first time, but as they speak in their tongues, you'll begin to understand. And what I find is, if I'm willing to listen to them in their language, they become more likely to do what? Listen to me in my language. And that's an amazing thing when that happens. So, um, you know, speaking in tongues, well, I don't know. Maybe it's not so different than what we need to do. <clears throat> Let's come to God in prayer. Almighty and merciful God, our prayer this day is that you fill us with your Holy Spirit. That you allow us not just to uh, speak in other tongues, but to listen in other tongues, to understand what other folks are saying, to get the message, and then to come alive and to respond to not only what they're saying, but to what you're saying most of all. And then maybe we can get excited about what we're doing. Maybe we can get a good feeling about serving others. Maybe we can have some hope and some joy will return to us. But we don't do any of that, Lord, without your help. We need for you to once again light the fire and then to stoke that fire. Please. You've asked me to bring a message. 
And I think I'm probably one of the worst when it comes to speaking and listening to other tongues. Because I like my world. I don't want to hear about poverty and hungry children and people being dispossessed. I don't want to hear about people who who's watched their entire work, life's work blown up because somebody else wants their place. I don't want to hear about people shooting each other sometimes just for fun. Now, I don't want to hear any of that, Lord. But I need to. Because if I don't hear about it, I can't understand it. I can't feel it. I can't have any impetus to do anything about it, to act as you have asked us to act, to be engaged with those who hurt, to be the voice of the voiceless. Now, Lord, now, please, <laughs> I'm, not the, I'm not your guy. But you've called me to be your guy, so you know what? I have no choice, and, and I really am kind of happy that you've done that. <laughs> I just feel woefully inadequate. So I'll tell you what, Lord. How about you speak to your children today? I'll use my voice, use whatever means you, you need but, or want, but speak to your children. Talk to us about getting excited about what you've asked us to do and then send us out to do it. Use me as an instrument to do that, please. Make me transparent to your cross. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be holy and acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. A lot of times I'll, I'll be talking to people, and people know that uh, Pentecost is coming up. And I go, oh, Pentecost is coming. What's Pentecost? <laughs> it, it, it's another one of those things that you guys use as Christians, right, to kind of just change things up a little bit. Well, no, not really. Um, Pentecost... Oh, come on, thing. Don't do that to me. Yeah. <laughs> You know what? I printed it out so that it wouldn't do this to me. I got my backup. <laughs> the reason I, I need to do this, Pente most of us don't talk about Pentecost. We don't understand what it is. Um, Pentecost really was a Jewish festival. It was the Festival of Weeks. Um, it was the second of the major feasts of, of the Jewish community. And there are three major festivals for the Jewish community. As we, by the way, go through the book of John, we'll, we'll encounter each of the um, festivals uh, because that's how John did his, his book. And so we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about them, but it was one of those. It's 50 days after Passover, Pentecost, and it celebrates the, uh, the grain, the barley harvest. Most of the, the things, the festivals that we find in, in Jewish history or in, in the Jewish tradition have to do with, with festival, uh, with um, harvest and with, with either planting or harvesting, um, which was easy to understand. That was their, their thing. That was what they did back then. So it is, uh, uh, it celebrates the end of the harvest. In other words, whew, we did it, <laughs> we, and we got food to eat, all right? And I am going to go up there so I can have something to hold my... That's why they did this thing, huh? For Christians, Pentecost is, is 50 days after the crucifixion. Um, and it's 10 days after Jesus ascends into heaven. And, and he says to his, his followers at the ascension, wait. Now, how many of us are really good at waiting? Oh, 
Well, you know what? They weren't real great at it either, but they did. And they went back and they waited for the, the 50 days. Um, and it, it was really, um, for Christians, the, the coming of, a celebration of the coming of the Holy Spirit. Now, we're told what happens there. And it really is, for the early Christians, a celebration of the conversion of 3,000 people. I want to know what Peter preached, because <laughs> he got himself 3,000 converts. Here they come. They're coming down the road. No, no, no sorry. But, but he, he got 3,000 people to listen, to convert, to hear the good news, to, to know that God loves them. That's really the message that if you read Peter, that's, that's the message he brought. Um, but for the disciples, it was even more. Pentecost was following Jesus. Once Jesus was ascended, he wasn't there anymore. His, their leader was gone, um, at least in physical terms. Um, so for them, it really was their final equipping the ascension, and then Pentecost was the final gift to them that got them ready and, and prepared them and gave them what they needed to go into the world and to do their job. See, I think we've lost that. I think, how many of you, um, after, well, first of all, let me do it this way. How many of you, when you were preparing to join the church, how many of you were told that you were expected to be a disciple, which meant that there were certain things you were expected to do, like, uh, oh, I don't know, maybe Bible study, maybe prayer, maybe uh, reaching out to people, offering them the gift of salvation? How many of you were told that while you were getting ready for your baptism? Maybe one. Okay. Most people aren't told. How many? Let's do it that way. And, and I, I love this because I love the image. I have the image of Baptists who get people and are just anxious to get people into the water, into the water, wade in the water, and get them into the, into the pool, and we get them wet, and we dunk them, which I really find interesting. We, we do two things that people are terribly afraid of, and that's take them under the water backwards. How many of you are volunteering for that more than once? Um, but we do that, and then we send them out of the pool. And we leave them standing on the other side of the pool, dripping wet and wondering what to do next. Shame on us. You see why people, how many of you are excited to do that? Here, I'll tell you what, let me, let me take you. I'm going to dunk you in a pool, probably a little bit cold. Dunk you in a pool backwards, and then take you out. Then you can get out of the pool and you can stand there and drip wet and wonder what to do next. How many of you are volunteering for that one? You see what we've done to ourselves? Do you see what we've done to people who want to become Christian? And frankly, they're even willing to be dunked backwards, and then we don't tell them what to do on the other side. We have got to be about disciple-making if we plan on making any difference. And you know what? The problem is we have gotten, I'm going to go on my little tantrum here. Church has become two things. The theology of church in the 19, I believe probably as early as the early 1900s, but certainly in the 60s and 70s, church, theology of church became two things. Church equals Sunday morning for an hour, for an hour, no more. I've got brunch. And church equals building. I mean, we spend, and I'm not saying, please don't mishear you, hear this. I know you spend a bunch of money on this building. But for so many people, that's all that matters. The church that I just served, and they know I'm saying this because I said it to them often enough, beautiful church. They spent millions of dollars on their building while the community around them starved to death, literally. I think we've got we to get our heads straight. 
we got to be about making disciples. What, what, I'm sorry. Somebody tell me what the Great Commission is. What's the Great Commission? Well, there's a commentary too, isn't it? Great Commission is go into the world and... Sorry? Share the good news. Or if you really read the translation, it goes into the world and make what? Disciples. Not converts. See, Billy Graham finally got that. For years, Billy Graham would make converts. People would come down droves because he was a good preacher. And they'd come down and they'd say, yes, I want to be a Christian. Until you met him the next day. No difference. He finally got so fed up with it, he said, look, I'm not coming to anybody's town where the the, uh, pastoral community does not stand with me. When we do an altar call, you need to be there. And if there's somebody from your church or your community, you need to be willing to meet with them, give them your name, your phone number, find out what they're about, and offer them what they need. And if you're not willing to do that, I'm not coming to town. Most people don't know that that was the case. Clergy knew it. Most of us stopped going, actually. You see, folks, we have got to be about Pentecost. But, you know, what I can't do, let's see if I can do this without falling down the steps. Hey, Glenn. Good to meet you, buddy. Glad you're in church. (laughs) What did I just do? Greeted him. I shook his hand, and I walked away without even offering. How's life? Is there anything I can do for you? Is there anything we can do for you? Anything we do to help? And, 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 you know, I'm not looking for intimate things at this point. But, man, is there something we can do to make your life better. See, that's what, and, and then I, I need to say, you know, Craig, you need to understand that, that the reason that, um, first of all, you're a nice guy, and, and so I wanted to meet you. But I also wanted to meet you to let you know there's somebody else in this world besides you who might offer some help, if and when you need it. And that there's a God who loves you. That's all I wanted you to know. See, I think... Bob Schuler had the right idea. Anybody know what Schuler used to offer on, on his TV show as a, a gift? Either a bracelet or a, or a necklace. And you know what it, or even a button. You know what it said? Anybody know what it said? God loves you, and so do I. God loves you, and so do I. He had it right. We need to be saying that to everybody we meet. Hi. How's your life? Most people will tell you pretty quickly that life's not great. (laughs) Not the way they want it to be. Most people will declare for you pretty quickly, whether verbally or just looking and watching them, they're, they're, they're not happy. That, that life isn't for them what they wanted it to be. And frankly, as far as most people are concerned, nobody loves them. Or maybe one person does. But you know, I think we need to be saying to folks, look, God loves you, and so do I. And what we mean by that is God loves you. As God loves you, And I love you as your neighbor. I think if we as the church were to say to people, not just with our mouth, but with our actions and our excitement, to say to people, we love you. God loves you. Help me define that. What does that mean to you? person who I don't know yet 
or a person who I do know. What does it mean to you for me to say that I love you, what do I have to do and live up to it to make that happen, to make you believe that? And by the way, if that happened, would it be okay? Would it be a good thing? See, folks, I'm, we're, we're going to do communion here, so I'm going to cut back a little bit. But I guess at the end of the day, if you walk out of Pentecost with nothing more than a changed attitude that said, instead of making you a Christian, I'm going to show you what it means to live as a Christian by giving you the love that God wants you to have. What you do with it from there, up to you. But I'm going to do what God's called me to do. And by the way, if it looks good to you, you're more than welcome to join the journey. And I think we really do need to be, I think we need to be excited Christians to the point where somebody says, what's this, this Christian thing? What, what is it? And you can look at him and go, oh, man, it's a rush. Amen. Thank you.